And we are back here on Metal Nation Radio. I am Rustin Rose of Metal Holic, and you just heard Saber and Torch from the upcoming new album from Ed Guy, Space Police Defenders of the Crown, due out April 18th in Europe and the world, the 28th here in the U.S. With us tonight, co-founder and guitarist Jens Ludwig. How are you doing, brother? I'm doing pretty fine. How are you? Absolutely wonderful. It's an honor to finally get a chance to talk with you. I'm sort of surprised after doing this 25 years. We've, we've never chatted before, but hey, there's always the first time, so... Yeah, I think it was about that time. <laughs> <laughs> now, the new album, this marks the, the band's 10th studio effort. You guys started the band 20 years ago when you were still teens. Is any of that sort of surreal for you? I mean, because the Beatles and Led Zeppelin barely made it a decade. Yeah, it, it, it's more than 20 years already. Oh, uh, well, but, you know, uh, 20 years of band, well, who cares? Uh, we're still in our 30s, so... Um, we're not that old yet, but uh, you're right, it's quite surreal, because when I think back when we started the band, of course, nobody ever imagined, of course, we were dreaming about uh, maybe being a famous musician and maybe uh, play some shows outside of Germany, but uh, of course, we couldn't imagine that it went this far, and especially for such a long time. Absolutely, and like you said, you guys are still very young. You guys could be doing this for another two decades or so, so who knows? Now, well, that's what we're working on. <laughs> now, each album has brought you guys greater recognition here in the United States, but so many have yet to discover Ed Guy over here. For the new listeners, what did you and Tobias have in mind when you started this up back in the early 90s, and how have you managed to stay true to yourselves? Uh, well, I think the, the start was the most difficult point because uh, when we started the band, it was, as you said, the beginning of the 90s. Um, well, starting a traditional heavy metal band at the beginning of the 90s, you know, when everybody was just listening to grunge and all that stuff, I think that was the first, the first big, big, big uh, try we had to, <laughs> we had to manage, we had to, to finish, you know. But, um, well, it, it was pre pretty tough at the beginning, but, uh, well, it was actually the thing that we really wanted. We really were believing in ourselves and uh, just tried not too many people to, let, to interfere with our music, with what we are thinking. And, uh, well, that, that brought us to some good places at the end. So for the new album, Space Police Defenders of the Crown, it's such a uh, big album, it required a double title? Uh, yes, definitely. No, it's... Uh, yes, that's one aspect. And the other aspect is, uh, you know, now, nowadays you have to come up with even better ideas, you know, for the marketing and stuff. And we're really trying to give value for money, having two album titles for the price of one. So, uh. Absolutely. So, And it sort of hits both sides of the album. I mean, you, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but you guys have always had sort of the sense of humor, tongue-in-cheek thing. And then the other side, you know, my understanding, Defenders of the Crown, is sort of your feel that you're one of the true metal bands and you're defending that crown because you guys have stayed true to who you are for so many years. Well, exactly. But you, you, you're much better than we are because... For me, the clue came after we sh were, were choosing the name. You know, first of all, we had the Defenders of the Crown. And, um, yeah, as you mentioned, we were thinking of, well, that sounds like an epic heavy metal record. It sounds really big and huge. And, uh, but then Toby had the, uh, a song title called Space Police. And, uh, well, we really liked that one for an album title as well, because that's definitely a title, uh, no other traditional metal band would call their album Space Police. And so we decided, well, we can, we can go with both. You know, if you think of Space Police, Defenders of the Crown, it sounds like, like a beginning of a trilogy. It sounds like a movie, like a Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade or Harry Potter and whatever. You know what I mean? Right. But, um, but at the end, you know, after, after a couple of weeks when we had to set the title, we were thinking about, well, it also fits perfectly to the band because on one hand, we have the real, uh, the serious side, like making serious music and with Defenders of the Crown. And on the other hand, we have Space Police showing the little bit freaky side of the band. So it's the perfect match. Right, and as we just mentioned, humor and sort of those tongue-in-cheek elements have always sort of gone hand-in-hand -hand as part of Ed Guy. Why is that so important to what Ed Guy is? Um, because that's what we are. It's, I mean, it's, uh, we really enjoy what we are doing. We enjoy hanging together, hanging around in the studio or in the rehearsing room in the tour bus. You know, whenever we're together, we, we're sort of having a good time and we're fooling around and joking around and just enjoying ourselves. And, well, we definitely see no reason why this shouldn't be a part of our music, why it's a part of our personality. So uh, it, it was never forced, you know, to, 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 uh, uh, to make some silly jokes on any album. But it just happens. And if it happens and we can really have a laugh about it, then we see no reason why we shouldn't share it with our fans. 
So now, Toby has called this Ed Guy's heaviest album to date. What is your perspective of the new record? Yeah, I think it, it definitely has uh, the, the heaviest parts we had we had in our, our history. I mean, uh, listening to the song Saber and Torch, uh, the part in the middle could also have been written by Creator, for example. <laughs> so that, that, that's what I really love about the album, is the, the freshness. And, you know, being heavy doesn't necessarily have something to do with uh, playing even faster or playing darker. For me, uh, ACDC, for example, can be much heavier than any black metal band. It's just, for me, heaviness means that... Uh, uh, the songs are really coming to the point, and that that's the feeling uh, that's the feeling that I have about the new album. The songs are really coming straight to the point, and uh, that's also a kind of heaviness for me. Right, and he sort of also said this is going to be the album that sort of sets the standard for what's to come with Ed Guy. Would you agree with that? Definitely, definitely. I mean, every album does. You know, we're not doing records for just for just doing another record. You know, make, doing records for us is always. Uh, always a big challenge of course we want to want to make an even better album than than the last one and we're trying to to make new elements to to just to just do something that we haven't done before and do something that we feel is the shit you know what i'm talking about right. uh, if you're doing just albums for okay we need another 10 songs to please the record company then it doesn't work for us we all always want to have the challenge that this has to be the thing Ed Guy is standing for in the year 2014, and uh, that's the aim, w what we have in mind when we start doing a record. Well, right. maybe not in the year 2020, then the aim would be to make an album that uh, sounds like Ed Guy in the year 2020, but for this year, that's the year. <laughs> nice. Now, Toby, prolific songwriter that he is, generally always writes most of the band's material on every album, but you always tend to write a track or two. Is that true for this record as well? Yeah, for this record, I had two. I had uh, Do Me Like a Caveman and Shadow Eaters. And, uh, well, I, I, I could have done more, but, uh, <laughs> uh, well, you know, that's always the thing is uh, it, it has to mesh at certain points. You know, I'm always presenting a lot of ideas to Toby, and uh, sometimes he, he's got a connection to it and knows immediately how to, how to react on an idea and get his input to it, and sometimes it just doesn't work, you know. That's not a matter of, of quality. It's just a matter of the music and taste and how, to, how, to, how you approach to different ideas. But, uh, well, I, I will keep on trying. Right. Now, when he writes the songs and everything, does he bring them in like pretty much fully developed or does he sort of bring the skeletons to you and then you sort of help him mesh them out being the, the prominent guitar player in the band? Well, that, that really depends. I mean, sometimes he really has an exact picture in mind of how things should sound. For example, the... the uh, the beginning of Love Tiger, the guitar riff, he had exactly in mind how, how it should sound, and it really took a while to, uh, well, to, to, to develop to me the idea of how it should sound, because, of course, as a guitar player, you play things you believe it's right, and if the singer has something different in mind, mind playing-wise, then, uh, well, you have to start out how to come together. So uh, sometimes he really has uh, very, very clear ideas, and sometimes he's just uh, got a riff or a melody, and we're working on everything else together. So it really depends. Love Tiger, the first single, got a very, I don't want to say poppyish, but it's definitely got sort of that glam metal 80s feel, you know, in the guitar riff and everything that you were just talking about uh, before the jump. Uh, yeah, yeah, true. I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely 80s inspired. Well, you know, we love the 80s. We love, we love that, that kind of music. We love the we, we love the attitude of the bands in, in the 80s, like where everything was about having a good time. And, um, well, Love Tiger is actually a song that goes into the same direction. It goes into uh, having a good time, but also it's, uh, it's about making people have a good time. Even if they don't want to, you have to force them sometimes. <laughs> and again, some more of the tongue-in-cheek there. But uh, um, one of the things I love most about the guitar playing on this record is that your solos always seem to fit the vibe of the main riff on Love Tiger, as we were just talking. The riff has that 80s glam metal vibe, and the solo has that upbeat buoyancy. Then on like the realms of Baba Yaga... That has a very Jakey Lee era Ozzy style riff, and again, the solo fits perfectly. How do you approach your solos? Do you write them out, or do you just sort of let your fingers go where they may? Uh, yes. <laughs> well, I, I just improvise. You know, every everything I'm all, all the solos I play, uh, they come along by improvising. You know, I make myself a playback, or if the song is already recorded, I, I'm playing to the playback and to the chords, and. Uh, then everything is coming together more or less automatically. You know, you have a good part here. You say, okay, that's pretty perfect. And you play along. 
so everything comes by improvisation. You know, I, I can't I can't even read notes, so I don't have any other chance than to improvise. <laughs> Well, and like I said, it always just seems to come out perfect. And you've heard albums before where the guitar solo may be really good, but it doesn't seem to fit the uh, the actual vibe of the riff for the song. And it's like, okay, this is great, but it just doesn't quite match up. And and you have a knack for making those two fit together. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, and uh, that's that's one of the things I've always noticed from the very beginning with with Ed Guy. So, um, now you guys have have done cover songs in the past, but usually mm-hmm. they're reserved for bonus tracks. You decided to slap Rock Me Amadeus in the middle of the record. How did you pick that particular track, and, and why did you choose to put it in the middle of the record? Well, for, first of all, we always, or, or, or let's say not always, but uh, in the last couple of years, there's always been the idea of doing a cover version from a Falco song, because, uh, well, everybody in the la- band likes Falco as an artist. We like his, his personality. He was just, uh, he wasn't great artist and he's done some great music some extraordinary music um but back then we were thinking about doing a cover version of a song called Der Kommissar which mm-hmm. is maybe not that much known as Rock Me Amadeus but it was actually uh, Sasha Ped our producer who this time came along with the idea uh, he said guys if you want to do a cover version you need to do it for Rock Me Amadeus because when he was looking at the video and also at the movie Amadeus he saw a lot of similarities to Toby, like the, the having the wild child, the little little bit confused genius, and he saw similarities to Toby. That's why he proposed Rock Me Amadeus. And what well, we liked, everybody in the band liked the idea, so we were uh, doing some research first on the internet, you know, like as for inspiration, if you want to call it. And we wanted to check out if there are any other cover versions existing, and we found out that there's almost no, at least no good cover version of this song existing. And, uh, well, that, that made us curious, and uh, we started working on this song, and then we pretty soon became an idea why there is no good cover version, because it's uh, so very, very difficult to do a cover version of this song that is not sounding ridiculous, you know. And uh, well, the big, biggest part, or let's say the biggest success of making this song sound as good as it does, in my opinion, is Toby, because he was really focusing on matching the, the Austrian accent, on matching the pronunciation of, of every single word. He, word. he was really spending weeks by doing that. And, um, well, I especially personally love the parts where Toby is coming through. You know, he's rapping that, that verse part, and then at certain points, there's really Toby's coming through, how he's regularly singing is, and I really love this part. Yeah, it turned out wonderfully. I mean, I, I was sitting listening to the album last night in preparation to talking with you. And my girlfriend was sitting there, and she she can't stand a lot of that 80s pop rock stuff, and she hated that song. But when she heard your guys' version, she's like, I like this. <laughs> this okay. sounds really good, you know? <laughs> so it, it came out really well. You know, that, that, that's the thing with a lot of 80s pop. As soon as you put some electric guitars and real drums in it, it sounds good. <laughs> Well, you know, this is sort of an embarrassing story, but I, it's it's true. When I was growing up, when I was a teenager, I, the shower was my studio, of course, and I used to always sing pop songs in my head and put real heavy metal guitars to them in my mind, like what they would sound like if they were rocked yeah. up, you know? But uh, now, have you guys ever considered doing like a whole album of covers at some point? Um, no, no, not yet. Not maybe, yet. maybe someday if, if we feel like you're doing it, we do it. Uh, well, we never had so many cover versions, actually, as you, as you mentioned, sometimes for bonus track, but that's basically it. I think um, we, we do this now and then because we just uh, we just have fun doing it. But for a whole album, I, I personally would prefer uh, writing my own stuff. Absolutely. Now, you had mentioned just a moment ago, Sasha, you turned to Sasha Paith again to produce. What is it about that relationship that works so well for you? Well, he's just an extraordinary producer, and uh, he knows the band now for, for such a long time. And uh, we're not yet uh, arrived at the point where we cannot learn from each other. So there's still a lot of input that he can give us, and there are still a lot of ideas that uh, we can work out together. And he still can, can push us. You know, sometimes you have the feeling when working with a producer or working with a studio or working with, with anybody for, for a longer period, at a certain point, you may have the feeling that, okay, that's it. Now we can't go any further together. But uh, we still haven't reached that point. We still think that we can achieve some great music together. And uh, the latest album is the best proof, I think. It, because, uh, in my opinion, it sounds very fresh. It sounds very spontaneous. And that's, um, that's all, of course, that's also uh, uh, Sasha's fault, if you want to call it that way. <laughs> 
So now, what can fans expect on the upcoming tour? Because there have been rumors about a lot of older tracks coming out of the woodworks. There's been that joke that you guys were going to have NASA build the stage set. What's up your sleeve? How much of the new album will you be playing? Well, a couple of songs. I mean, if it's up to me, I would play the whole album, but uh, we, obviously we can't do that. Uh, the, the key is to t- try to find a good, a good combination of you know, new songs and old songs, let's say the classics, uh, that the people want to hear, and for for the diehard fans, find one or two songs that they have never, maybe have never heard before live. Some older stuff, except the new one. And um, well, that's always very difficult because because the more albums you have out, the the dip, more difficult it gets to choose the right set list. But I'm very optimistic that we will find a good combination like we always did. And um, honestly, I'm pretty happy that we're still a band where the people are coming to our shows and still want to hear the new material. I mean, that's a that's a good compliment and shows that the band is still has still not reached their peak. It's peak, you know. And for the for the stage set, well, we're trying to make something extraordinary. Let's put it this way. You know, when people come into a show, uh, our goal is not to make them just see another heavy metal show. Uh, we want to make it kind of an event, you know, see something that uh, they didn't expect to see. And if, if we can manage that, then we're happy. Absolutely. I mean, I grew up, my band was Kiss, so, you know, I'm all yeah. about the stage presentation and everything as well as the music. Now, yeah. You've you've been playing alongside Toby for, for, like we said, two decades or so. You're not only his partner in crime, I, I assume, obviously, you've been playing with him so long, you got to be a big fan of his songwriting. So what are perhaps two or three over that 20-year span of your favorite songs that he's written so far? Oh, favorite songs that he's written so far? Uh, ooh, that, that, that's a difficult question. I think one of my favorites is definitely The Piper Never Dies from uh, uh, Hellfire Club. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me think. Uh, Space Police is maybe one of one of the best choruses he's done, in my opinion. Tough question. <laughs> uh, a, very, a very underrated song, in my opinion, has always been Fairy Tale from the Vainglory Opera album. Nice, good mix there old and new give us three albums from any genre that changed your life sort of brought you where you're at uh definitely acdc back in black which uh, is the rock and roll album for me it's scorpions worldwide life it's uh, the album that brought me to rock and roll music and then i would say it's a uh, halloween keep all the seven keys part two that brought me to the whole direction of speed and power metal Nice, nice. That's a, those are great, great choices. So before we get out of here, just for fun, the pointless question of the week. What is your favorite comfort food? Oh, yeah, that. A cup of pizza. Pizza, nice. Yeah, simple and effective. <laughs> Absolutely. Is there a favorite topping? Or- yes, uh, pepperoni salami. <laughs> Jens Ludwig of Ed Guy, the new album, Space Police Defenders of the Crown, coming out April 18th, pretty much everywhere, and then over here in North America on the 28th. Jens, it was an honor to get a chance to talk with you. The new album is fantastic. I can't wait. Thank for you it. very much. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think we will head out of here listening to what's one of your all time favorites in hard rock metal songs? Uh, Fear of the Dark. Iron Maiden. Fear the Dark, Iron Maiden here, Metal Nation Radio. Jens, thanks so much for taking the time, and we'll see you on the road. Thank you, and see you. Bye-bye.